Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Malthouse Games Podcast. My name is Delton. I'll be your host today, and with me, as usual, is my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. Howdy, partners. This is the Malthouse Games Podcast, episode number 143. We are a podcast all about board games, card games, dice games, role-playing games, tabletop games, things of that sort. Usually some kind of beer. Today, it is coffee. More specifically, Starbucks, like... Yeah. 20th anniversary coffee. There you go. 20th anniversary. 30th anniversary. I'm sorry. I don't know. Pike's Place special roast bag of coffee beans. Here's the thing. Starbucks is fine. We got a bunch of Starbucks gift cards for various holidays that we cashed in and, and bought a whole bunch of beans. Yep. My only problem with Starbucks beans is that no matter what bag you buy, it's it all, all the tastes same. like a Starbucks bean. It like, all tastes like the same coffee. It all tastes like the same coffee. Like there might be very different variations of the same coffee, but if you taste a Starbucks coffee, it tastes like a Starbucks bean. And that's not that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you like that Starbucks flavor, by God, you are not gonna go wrong with a Starbucks bag of coffee. But that's exactly what we have. We have a Starbucks coffee. It's fine. It's supposed <laughs> to be like a smooth truffle flavored and I taste Starbucks coffee. Like anything yeah. that Starbucks makes. I lose all the other notes it says on the bag because Mm -hmm. it just tastes like Starbucks. It's all contaminated as Starbucks. (laughs) Now, don't get me wrong. I love coffee, and I I will drink gas station coffee, and I will drink this Starbucks coffee gladly, and I have for the last week. But bone apple teeth, Mm -hmm. Starbucks 30th anniversary, silver coffee that we are drinking because, again, we are recording this at 9.30 in the morning on Sunday before this comes out. But we've had kind of a rough couple weeks here. Yeah. Uh. We won't get into too many details about what happened, but uh, unfortunately, our fuzzy little son, Steve, has passed away. He did, our cat Steve, which we posted on social media, so if you want to see the story, uh, basically he was he got sick and could not push through the sickness no matter what was done. Um, so he had five vet appointments with three different vets, including an ER. Yes, so he was he was sick and getting better, and then sick and getting better, and then he got sick and it just did not get better, and uh, Tuesday morning, we found him passed away in our house, so... Oh, God damn it. <laughs> I know. It was, we, we, like, I canceled all clients for this week because I was like, I am not going to be emotionally present with anyone. So I canceled all clients for the week. Delton worked from home most of the week. I just worked on book work. But uh, I think what, what's, I mean, it's always challenging whenever you lose a pet, but I wanted to share a little bit about Steve. Everyone knows Steve the asshole. You probably know him from earlier episodes with him screaming outside of the door. And we said, take a drink whenever you, you yep. hear the Steve. Uh, but Steve, so whenever Delton and I first got together, you know, as couples do, I was like, I think they do, like they have those conversations of expectations and relationships and what do you want out of life and so on and so forth. And when we first got together, something I told Delton was, I will need to have a cat. I need at least one cat in our relationship. And Delton chuckles and he says, we'll see. And I said, no, 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 no. If we are going to get married eventually, I am going to need to have at least one cat. And so fast forward, so this was probably, I don't know, about three months into the relationship and fast forward to The next year, about December, uh, Delton's friend Melissa posts a picture on Facebook of this little fuzzy orange cat named Achilles because he kept attacking ankles and said, hey, you know, Achilles was found in the snow. He is really ornery. He likes to attack ankles. He's needing a good home. And like, I saw this picture and I said, that's my cat. He looks so pissed off. He looks so pissed off. Even as a kitten. I was like, oh my God, that's my cat. And I texted Delton and before I could even respond to Melissa, Delton texted back and said that he had... Uh, talked to Melissa, and we were picking him up in the next couple of days. Yep. And so we we picked him up. We drove out to, we were staying at Delton's parents. We drove out to uh, uh, Weatherford and picked him up, and he was already a bitey little guy, and I loved him so much. But that was also the moment that I realized that Delton was really serious about our relationship because he got a cat. Because I was living in, like, student apartments. I couldn't have pets. And so Delton got this fuzzy orange asshole to stay at his apartment for the next four to six business months while I'm finishing up my degree in Stillwater before we can move in together to our house. And I think it's been hard the last couple of weeks. So he passed away on Tuesday. It's a Sunday. It's been hard the last couple of weeks because we've just been, well, really the last month, we've been balls of anxiety. Stress. It's been so, like, we, it's been hard to focus on anything. It's been hard to focus on games. Like, I just feel like at the end mm-hmm. of the day, we're so emotionally exhausted. Like, we just, we just fall asleep. And this last week has been very, very hard not having him here. And I think Delton said it best whenever he said, it, our house feels like an Airbnb. Because we've never known this house without Steve. He lived in the apartment, and then he moved in with us. And so and it's been nine years this month since we moved in. And so it's been it's been challenging this last week. We've definitely felt the waves of grief. Grief sucks. Uh, but, you know, I haven't cried yet today. Knock on wood. I'm really proud of myself for not crying right now, too. Well, if you don't shut up, I'm going to be there, and it's going to be a bad episode. Okay. <laughs> I'll stop. But, yes, so thanks to everybody for the outpouring of support. 
not gonna cry. <laughs> Dang it. That's what gets me. Whenever people like I really appreciate all the support and it means so much to me. And so thank you guys for the outpouring of support, for taking good care of us. Uh, we haven't had to cook a meal since Monday because everyone keeps bringing us food. So thank you guys. And uh, if you have any S- Steve stories, send them to us in like six weeks, whenever we process a little bit more because I want to hear them. They won't be stories. They'll just be pictures of scars. Picture, yes. <laughs> Which already, is accurate. This is accurate. My friend Allison, whenever he passed away, uh, she sent a, she told me like, he'll always be memorialized in my wedding pictures because she had stayed at our house the week before her, her wedding. I think about, or no, it was about six months. It was a while. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, I didn't think about that. And no, she got her good. She got he got her good. But she had scars all down her leg from him attacking her in her wedding pictures. So <laughs> memorialized yeah. in that way and many other ways. So thank you guys for listening. And then let's all have a drink for Steve. A drink of coffee. Drink of coffee. Because it's morning time. <laughs> for the tea. Ah, <laughs> oh, Jesus. Well, to get past that before this whole episode just turns into an uh, uh, me shutting it down and saying, there's seven minutes for you, bye. <laughs> uh, in the past couple weeks, the, the, the few things we have done, uh, we really haven't played a ton of games. We have played with some friends, which has been yes. helpful. We played with uh, Cullen and Megan last night, which was re- or night before last, which was really fun. Yes, we had my friend Cullen and his fiance Megan over. Uh, we got to play some games with them. We played Fun Employed and Left Right Dilemma and Just One. Um, did we play anything else or just those three? Uh, just One, Left Right Dilemma. Fun employed. I think that was it. I think that was it. But I tell you what, you really learn a lot about your friends. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> playing, playing, uh, especially uh, uh, Left Right Dilemma. Absolutely you do. But that was a really good time. We got to have dinner with them and then play some games and hang out and visit because we don't get to see Cullen too often and we're just getting to know Megan. So it's nice to be able to spend more time and play games. Um, I'm trying to think if we played more games. A couple, it was a couple weeks ago now I got to play Meltwater with Tyler online, but that was... That was a few weeks back. I can't remember. I think that's really been kind of it. Yeah. Otherwise, we've, we've watched a lot of The Office. Yes. That's been our comfort show is just The Office has been playing in the background for the last five days, six days at least. Yeah. And then the only other thing we really did was yesterday we actually went out and about for a bit. We tried to get out every day this week, at least for an hour, just so we're not just wallowing in sadness every day. But yesterday we put on real pants and I put on eye makeup and we went out into the world and... We went garage sailing, didn't find too much. Uh, We We found one thing. We found one thing, a book from 1974 on national parks, which is cool. A really cool coffee table book. And then I took Delton to the Feathery Crow, and he got something cool. I did. And uh, the Feathery Crow is basically like a little consignment secondhand, you know, kind of shop. And we're looking around, and they they had some, uh, basically somebody brings in horror stuff, or uh, somebody else has some old action figures, just fun stuff that I enjoy. And we're looking around, and I look up, and there is a Pinhead Funko Pop. Technically, the Pinhead is from Hellraiser 3, which I actually have not seen, but it's a Pinhead Funko Pop that's one of the vaulted ones from, I don't know, 2014, 2015, something like that. And it is signed by the original Pinhead, Doug Bradley. And so I was like, well, that's really cool, but how do I know that's accurate? So I look it up, and it looks like it was one of those things where they basically sign so many with a company and sell it at either a convention or something like that. But it is uh, it is a legit signature. It has the certification sticker on the box as well as a certification card from Beckett. Both numbers match. Checked them on their website. Everything lines up perfectly with the inscription and all. And so I definitely bought it because that's freaking cool. Um, it was like a third of the price of what it was going for online too. Yes. Yeah. I picked it up. I spent spent more than I normally would on something like that. So I spent sixty dollars. But the most recent sell on eBay was a hundred and eighty, which made me feel good in general. But also it's like I don't buy autograph stuff normally because it's way it just overpriced. But this is one of those really awesome things that was like, this is a hell of a deal for something that a hell razor you, of a deal. There you go. That you won't find often. So I was very excited about that. So I've got it now up here with some of my other action figures until I can get a good display going for stuff. But yeah, so I found that, which was awesome. Yes, and then we went to the comic shop, and Delton got the first issue of Watchmen. We also had a brief conversation with some actors from Game of Thrones. Yes, I do not remember their names. Um, they were prominently featured extras in the, a couple of the later seasons, I think. Very, very Irish. Extremely Irish accents, but uh, if you see their pictures, if you watch the Game of Thrones and you would see their pictures from Game of Thrones, you would be like, oh yeah, I remember that. Um, but they were really nice. We chatted with them for just a second. Um, they were there and we did a little shopping around for the sale and talked to the owner like always and his wife and had a good time doing that. It was nice to get out and about, but by the time we got home, we hadn't eaten. 
And it was like five o'clock when we got home. All day. Our eating's been all screwed up this week. Yeah. So we hadn't eaten at all. We were tired. We got home, ate some dinner, promptly went to sleep about six, six thirty. Woke up about eight thirty, got something else to eat, played the game for this episode, watched some TV, fell asleep on the couch till about one thirty, then went to sleep till about eight this morning. Yes, I'm hoping that starting today we're gonna be back on our regular routine. Still processing everything from this last week, but ready to reintegrate into society after a very stressful four weeks. I think so. I think we'll be back on schedule and back to where we can play some more games. Oh, here's the door. It's straight ahead. It's it's a game. So the game for today was gifted to us uh, by Haley's mom for Christmas. Thanks, mom. This is Trekking the National Parks. Uh, Trekking the National Parks is published by Underdog Games. The art and game design was by Charlie Bink. Cover illustration by Robert uh, Islas, is how I'm going to pronounce that, or Islas, I'm not sure. This is, I should say, the second edition from what I was looking online. Uh, The photography of Carlsbad Caverns and Voyagers provided by Andrew Thomas. Uh, Photography of, it looks like... Halea Kala, which is in Hawaii. Great Smoky Mountains, Zion, Shenandoah, and Gateway Arch are licensed from Shutterstock. That's funny. Uh, Photography of Wind Cave by Marie Chittister. Photography of White Sands by Roberto Martire. All other photography are by John Binkle. And yeah, this is the second edition. Yeah, so all of the photography you can definitely tell is uh, pictures that folks have taken. Yeah. It, It looks just like, okay, I'm going through somebody's scrapbook from their National Park Adventures. Well, what's fun about this game, uh, before we get into the actual game itself, is inside the lid, it actually has the story of this designer. His parents, uh, they had a goal of seeing every single national park, and they successfully did that. And he wanted to make a game to kind of replicate that back. And I think the original game was like 2011, 2012, and then this second edition was 2014 or 15. But uh, it's based on that, and so I think a lot of that is, it's supposed to have that feeling of these are your photos like you said. So it's very, very much pointing itself toward that direction of like, this is what it looks like rather than just an illustration. So the game itself for Trekking National Parks is very simple in the way that it plays. The box says 30 to 60 minutes. We did it in about 23 for us two. It says 10 and up. I think you could lower that to eight, if not seven. It's a very simple game. Yes. This game, the way I explained it to Haley was... Ticket to ride minus the trains. And you basically have how trekking the national parks works. It's very simple. And oh, it's relaxing too. Like it's not as simple as a, oh, this is just boring. Like, no, it's simple. It's easy. It is relaxing and it's fun. It's definitely a good uh, introductory game, a good family game with a younger audience. Someone who's not used to board games. This is like a really easy, simple dive into it. And then it's also just a theme that we enjoy. So the way the game's going to work is you have a little meeple on the map. You start around, I think it's like, I think we determined it was Missouri area is where your little meeple starts on the map. And it's a map of the whole U.S., including Alaska, uh, American Samoa, which is a national park, Hawaii, and Florida Keys, and the other one's off of Florida. So on your turn, you can take two actions. You can repeat them or do anything different. You can draw a card, a trek card, which is essentially the resources you need to... uh, collect the parks cards or you can use those trek cards for movement so there could be like a red boot that has a three the red boot card counts as one boot for collecting a park no matter what the number is the number is how many spaces you can move if you use that card to move you can burn as many cards as you want to move you can just never uh you always have to do exactly the number you discard so if you discard a four you can't move three you have to move four even if you have to do a weird wiggle around the board in a strange connection pattern. You just get lost. You get off trail. It's fine. Happens to the best of us. There you go. But yes, you can either draw a trek card, you can move, you can claim a park if you have the necessary cards in hand, or you can occupy a major park, which is basically putting a tent down, getting a one-time or continuous benefit and points at the end of the game. Uh, Every time you move, you're going to pick up a little stone off of the park that you move, uh, stop your turn at, your move at, I should say. Those stones at the end of the game, they're whoever has the most of each color is going to get points. So the most blue gets a certain amount of points. The most yellow gets the most amount of points. The most red gets so many points and so on. Uh, and then you just add up all the points on the parks that you've claimed, the parks you occupy, how many of the little, uh, I, I just said it, little stones you have collected. Any of your majority stones 
And then I think that's all of the point scoring. Yeah. So it's a really simple game. You've got a little map and you're just bouncing around. You cannot pass through other people, so they can effectively block you even if it's not permanent. Uh, you're going to be, there's always three parks available for you to claim. So you'll be able to rush to one and people can recognize that. And depending on what cards you have, you could claim it. They could beat you to it. They could go another direction. There's all kinds of different little uh, small, I feel like this would be, it would be more apparent the different strategies if you played with like four people. Yes, I be think so. Because the board would be more more heavily occupied. And I think it would be easier to see how blocking could affect somebody's pathways and stuff like that. But that's really the whole game. It's very simple. It's definitely a game, like I said, that's uh, great for families, great for introductory, but it did a good job because I like that on the cards for the national parks, it has little statistics, has little stats about it, talks about this park's that, or this park here, or this one was founded when, uh, and that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's a really, really fun little game. Yes, and it really informs my decision for the question of the episode, which we'll get to here in a little bit. Yes, it does. It really helped you with that decision for sure. For sure. But if you like the idea of a game about national parks and you're playing more than likely with family members, especially younger ones, this is a fantastic family game for that. I think that that's the space that this fills really well. Yes, because this, like, we have other national park games. Like, we, we have, have parks. We have parks. Uh, but this will definitely stay on our shelf because as Lakin gets uh, another year or two older, yeah. I think that this will be a game that she will really enjoy. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because like I said, it's not too complicated. It's very simple. It's straightforward. It's quick. All the iconography is big. It's easy to see. Like, I really do think that it, all in all, this just fits that, like, you expect to see this at Target. You expect to see this at Walmart because people will pick it up there and they will enjoy it and not be like, oh, this is way too complicated. Because sometimes you go to Target and see someone grab a game. And by the way they're talking about it, you know that they're not super familiar with, like, modern gaming. And it makes you kind of go, oh, that might be a little more than you're expecting from it. Like, it might be more complicated or something, but trekking is one of those that you'll never have to worry. The rule book took me all of two minutes to read, basically, because it's super short. Which kind of bothers me because there's a Mensa sticker on the front. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. So yes, that is everything with trekking the national parks in terms of how the game plays. And as Haley had a great little lead into this segment of the topic, trekking the national parks has the Mensa Select sticker on the cover. The Mensa Select sticker is something you see all across. I say all across. You see it on board games uh, pretty often. Some very popular board games. I actually have a list of those popular board games. Some of these do not display the sticker, and some of these do. It is up to the game company. They are able to once the Mensa process is, you know, done. Which they choose five per year. They choose, it looks like five per year, yep. And I don't think they've ever broken that. So the games that have had, this is a ranking of the BGG ranking. So essentially the most popular, arguably, games that have the Mensa Select um, status, I guess. Uh, Clank, the deck building adventure, the original. Trekking Through History, which is one of the newer versions of this trekking through the national parks. Trekking Through History is like the newer implementation. Architects of the West Kingdom, which is a little more of a complicated game. Azul, Raiders of the North Sea. You've got several games from the Gip series, Yinch and Link and stuff like that. Uh, there's a game called Acropolis, Dominion, which a lot of people will know. Life of a Chameleon. In 94, they gave it to Magic the Gathering. You've got Genotype, Castles of Mad King, Mad King Ludwig. One of our first ones, Suburbia. Um, Miyabi, Garden Bow, The New Mill 4, Village Pillage, Gizmos, which you like. I do like Gizmos. Gizmos is always fun. Harry Potter, Hogwarts Battle, The Duke, Hive, uh, looks like some more Gip series, and a game called Boop, which is the one from, uh, I think, Smirk and Laughter. It has kitties on it. It does. That was the 2023 edition. So. I like kitties. Those are the top 20, essentially top 25. I skipped over all the Gip one because you mentioned the Gip series, and you're basically good there. But yes, so Mensa, uh, before I let Haley get into it, I'm going to read what uh, this is from a poster on Board Game Geek edited this year called named Jeff Wolf, it says, is his at. Uh, every year, American Mensa holds an event in April called Mind Games, and at the end of which five games are named Mensa Select. It says, uh, this person, when he started this, Gamers Games rarely did well. I thought it might be interesting to build a list of past Mensa winners sorted by the rankings to see what came up. And that's what he did. The first ones were given in 1990. Originally, it was a panel of judges, but in 96, it was opened up to membership. Uh, 
Do, 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 do. To be considered, the game must be submitted by its publisher. So you have to submit for it. A different local Mensa group hosts the event each year. Uh, Mind Games begins on a Thursday, and the winners announce Sunday morning. During the event, each participant plays and evaluates 30 of the games that have been submitted for that year. All right. Within the, with the highly compressed evaluation period, Mensa Select Awards have historically tended to favor games that are quick and easy to learn, and many worthy games were not submitted by their publishers because they were not viewed as Mensa games. There you go. It's a good little thing. It is a good little thing. So, Haley... For everyone unaware, because I didn't know this for the longest time, what exactly is Mensa? So Mensa is an organization that is supposed to be a social club for those who have IQs within the the top 2% of the population. It was started, I think, in like the 1950s or 1960s. Uh, It's been around for a a bit, but, well, actually, I think it's a bit uh, older than that. Let me look it up here. So according to Mensa, it was established in 1946. And so I I find the Mensa Select sticker to be a bit problematic because what do you think of when you think of Mensa, Del? I mean, the first thing I thought when I first played Suburbia and it was a Mensa Select, was like, ooh, you have to be smart to like this game or be good at this game. Exactly. Yeah. And so Mensa, in, in my opinion, it just seems like a very elitist organization. I don't really like the idea of hierarchies being established based on uh, intelligence quotients. And so just just a disclosure. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a mental health therapist and part of my graduate training was to be trained in giving IQ tests. So I'm, I'm trained in giving IQ tests. I've, I've given IQ tests. I don't give them now. Uh, it's not within something that I, that I do. But, you know, I've, I've been tested for my IQ twice in my life. So I know my IQ. I've also, again, been been trained in it myself. And so I see what IQ can be used for. You know, IQ tests are often used for, you know, establishing competency in trial. It can be used to, uh, you know, inform uh, case formulations when it comes to uh, psychological assessments. It can be used to, you know, identify if a, a child or a person is at risk and, and needs more assistance in school and whatnot. There can be a use for IQ. However, we have to recognize that IQ tests were also developed by a lot of straight white men. Yeah. IQ tests have also been historically used uh, to oppress folks, to really elevate the more of the straight white folks, if you will. Albergine. Albergine? That's my favorite example. You mean, tell me about Albergine. Uh, ab- an, an Albergine. You ask any American oh. what an Albergine is. Yes. And 90% of people won't know. What is it? It's an eggplant. It's an eggplant, yes. But it's not used here. But we put eggplant, and then if somebody comes from another country and immigrates to America and takes an IQ test that says, what is an eggplant, and they don't know, it doesn't mean they don't know what an eggplant is. They don't know the word eggplant because every other country in the world basically calls it an aubergine. Exactly. So that's part of, that's an example, at least, small one. That's an example. And so when it comes to IQ, like, a lot of folks, you know, it does measure different forms of intelligence. So you'll have like your spatial reasoning, you'll have your working memory, you'll have uh, your you know, basic knowledge. But the thing is, a lot of these tests are really skewed towards the, the wealthy white population. It's really, really, really say straight white. It's really the wealthy white population. Because, for example, uh, part of the IQ test is just a general knowledge bank. And it'll ask you, uh, who, tell me who is Mahatma Gandhi. It'll say, who was Catherine the Great? Well, awesome. If you, you know, were able to go to school and learn those things, or that's something that was culturally relevant that was talked about in your school, you're probably going to perform really, really well. But if you went to a school where that wasn't taught to you, or maybe you focused on on different leaders or different people, then you're not going to be able to perform very well in that. And yes, it does look at different composite, or sorry, different areas. So you might have score really high in working memory and really low on uh you know, general history or whatnot. But once those scores are combined together, that gives you your, your general IQ. And so it's challenging because these, t- again, these tests were made by wealthy white people because that's who were able to go to college. And so they made tests for wealthy white people. And you see that wealthy white people tend to score more highly on these inventories. And it doesn't mean that people who aren't wealthy or people who aren't white aren't as intelligent it just means that these tests were created in a way where the tests are going to be skewed more towards these other individuals and so when i see things like mensa when i see things like you know people wearing their iq as a badge that really bothers me because one that's not what these tests were meant for 
I mean, that's not what their tests were meant for today. They were kind of created for that. I mean, IQ tests have historically been used uh, to as part of the eugenics movement. So, for example, oh, white people tend to have higher IQs, therefore they're the superior race. Da, 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 da. Well, yeah, the test was made for them. There is there is a really interesting uh, test that came out about, I want to say about 30 years ago or so, called the bitch test. Are you familiar with the bitch test? I'm not. So the bitch test was created by an African-American psychologist, and it was a a test that was written in the what he called the, the vernacular of African-American folks. White people cannot, I've taken the bitch test. I scored a one. Nice. <laughs> I scored a one. I, yeah. I was not good at the bitch test. And so that was, it was created to kind of show, okay, well, something written in the vernacular of, you know, a different culture, you're not going to score as well mm -hmm. either. And so it has nothing to do with intelligence, how well you score on that. It's just you are not in that culture. You don't have that understanding. But if you were to use that to say, oh, you're, you're, you know, your IQ is a one, Haley. I mean, is that fair? Maybe because I, I scored a one. <laughs> Probably so. But that's the thing is like when it comes to IQ, it is, yes, there, it has its place when it comes to like scoring for competency in trial or when it comes to, you know, lo looking at a full psychological examination, but using it as a badge of honor. So we, we were driving down Ed through Edmond one day and I saw a Mensa sticker and it had the person's IQ of like 145. I'm like, that's not even possible. That's not possible. When you look at IQ, so, uh, as the average IQ is a 100, a 100. And so IQ is scored based off of, so your score is based off of standard deviation. So if you have a score of, so the 85% of the population falls between 85 and 115. So 85% of the population falls within that. So yeah, about 50, so 85% of people fall between 85 and that 115. And so you have this certain select that Mensa says that is 130 or up, which means so 2% of the population uh, have IQs 130 and higher, and 2% of the population, math, have IQs of 70 and lower. Mm -hmm. And so what Mintz is looking at are those who have the, the IQ of 130 or higher. And so that 2% of the population, they say, like, that is who qualifies for Mintz. And there's multiple ways you can get in. You can take the IQ test. Uh, they used to accept SAT tests. I don't think they do anymore. But there's also a Mintz test that you can take over and over to get in. Which that bothers me too. You can they have Mensa has practice tests that you can take for eighteen dollars a pop mm. to practice to get into Mensa, and that's not also not how IQ works. You can't uh, practice up IQ. That's why you can only give IQ test uh, for adults. I believe it's every ten years for kids. I think it's every five years as you can give like, for it to be valid because you can't. You're not supposed to be able to practice your IQ test. And so you have this thing that skewed a lot towards the wealthy whites. You have something that has been historically used for a form of oppression. You have something that's being misconstrued as a badge of honor rather than of clinical use. And you're using this to create a social club. And I actually looked up Mensa uh, before our podcast today. And it said, so the Mensa, I guess, is Latin for table. And so the Mensa logo, the M, is supposed to look like a table because it says it's supposed to be welcoming for everybody to come join and talk. No, it's not. Oh, yeah. If you're just looking at the top, quote unquote, 2% of the population who can score highly on these tests that were created and skewed towards white, wealthy folks, that's not welcoming everyone to the table. And we have to look at that in psychology in general. Most uh, tests in psychology, most assessments are skewed towards the wealthy whites because most tests, even today, even today's test. So you could, even if you said, you know, screw the 1920 Stanford Binet. Like, we don't use that anymore, da, da 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 We have to look at these tests that are developed now because, so I was a researcher in college. Like, I, I, I did my own research for my own thesis. Um, I worked in a research lab cleaning data, most boring job ever. But if you, if you look at the participants in our research studies, so these are research studies made by psychologists for the use of publishing journal articles, for developing inventories, so on and so forth. The people that we have to test on are college students, most most participants are your freshman level college students who have to take part in research studies as part of their credit for their intro to psychology class, which almost every student has to take. And so who's who's in college? More I would suspect that colleges are majority white. A majority white and mm -hmm. majority more wealthy. Yeah. As well. Especially today because college is friggin' expensive now. Yes. Yeah. And so if you can't afford college, you can't afford to be in these research studies. So these assessments aren't being made for you. Ah, that makes sense. 
And so we have to look at that, not only the the past ones, because, you know, the, the original developers of Mensa, like they're also proponents of phrenology, which was, you know, looking at, at the skull shape of somebody and determining if they're going to be a criminal or they're going to be insane, quote unquote. Uh, so we can we can even if we <laughs> even if we completely gave up on everything that was said about intelligence in 1920s and 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. Today, we have to look at how are these tests being made? And who are they being made for? And who are they keeping out? Mm-hmm. And so for me, this idea of Mensa, and again, I'm going to say, I'm not just salty because I, I got a pretty good IQ according to these tests. I'm not going to say what it is. But <laughs> I'm not going to say that the IQ test doesn't have some clinical use. But for Mensa itself, I'm a really big critic of it because it gatekeeps a lot of people out. Mm-hmm. It makes people feel less than. And so whenever I see Mensa stickers, especially on something like Trekking Within National Parks, this game is fantastic. It's really fun. It's really simple. There's not a big barrier to entry like Delton talked about. It's, mm-hmm. it's really good. We can play this probably with as young as a seven-year-old. This would be a great thing to, to introduce people to. But I feel like it's a big barrier. Somebody's walking down the street or down the halls of Target or the aisles of Target, whatever, and they see this and they see the Mensa sticker on it. That might be a big barrier if they don't think that they're smart enough for it. Or if somebody puts this down on the table and they have, let's say that you have somebody who has... You know, we talked about ADHD a few, se- a few times ago. Yep. Somebody who has continuously scored poorly on standardized measures, you put a Mensa game down on the table, what might they think? Yeah, it might be like a traumatic response kind of thing. Yeah, it might make it, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do poorly at this. Yeah. Or this isn't going to be fun. Or I don't want to play this game. Mm-hmm. Or I feel like I'm being singled out. I'm not going to do well. And so we have to look at, I feel like with Mensa stickers, we have to recognize how detrimental IQ has been been Mm -hmm. to a lot of marginalized folks and how it still is used as a gatekeeping tool and also why the hell are we going to put it this on a game that's so simple yeah it's interesting because i mean part of that mensa thing too is in my experience how many people don't know what mensa is because i didn't for a long time Mm -hmm. i didn't until i started playing board games and played suburbia i was like what is this mensa thing and had to look it up and it's like oh this means i'm smart because i'm good at the game and that's, the, you know, it comes with that. So a lot of people probably also don't know what it is, which is easy to pass. You know, that's an, a whole nother thing. But uh, it's just one of those things where, like you said, it's annoying. I, I'm just going to speak from the non-clinical perspective. It's annoying when people are like, look, I'm so smart. Here's my IQ. Because intelligence isn't just how well you can remember who Catherine the Great is or how good you are at spatial reasoning. There's a lot of things to go into intelligence. And I know IQ tries to be a, like, uh, culmination of all these different parts and pieces and put it together and all that crap. But, you know, if you go into a, you go into a mechanic shop and try to fix a car like the mechanics, you're not going to have the, the intelligence in that field to do what they're doing. You know, uh, excluding every other type of intelligence in that moment, their working intelligence of what they're doing as a profession likely is miles ahead of you. Does that mean that you're smarter than them or they're smarter than you? No, not necessarily. In that field, sure, because they have the training, they have the experience, but it doesn't, like, how does that signify giving them a number and all of a sudden just saying, boom, you're smarter than this person? Because that kind of shit does lead to that elitism. It leads to that better than thou, holier than thou kind of attitude, which comes with board gaming in general for people who are a lot of times very big, heavy gamers. You know, oh, you're not not playing a complicated enough game. That's too easy for me. Like, that's already a thing, and I think Mensa can just add to that. However, with Mensa being on such a simple game, it does send weird, confusing signals. So it's just a, it's all over the place in my brain how to to parse where this fits in, you know? Yeah, and I I think you're right. Like, there's already so many elements of gatekeeping and board gaming. We don't need to add another one with this idea of this is Mm -hmm. an elite game. Yeah. And, you know, I do appreciate that Mensa has, you know, given such a simple game a, a, a Mensa sticker. For sure. Because, you know, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somebody's going to play this and, and they said, oh, I can do a Mensa game. I can do anything. Yeah. Like maybe maybe that's the case. Maybe that's kind of the idea, too. But, you know, your point of, you know, a, a mechanic may not score as high. Maybe they may, may might have really great spatial reasoning or whatnot. Maybe they don't score as high on the you know, history section mm-hmm. or the comprehension section as, as somebody else who's went to college or whatnot. But that, that your argument that that doesn't mean that they're not as intelligent, that's exactly what uh, Robert Sternberg, mm-hmm. uh, so he is a psychologist. I actually uh, worked under him at, at OSU. Uh, he started our, our, our uh, student tutoring lab. 
But he is a clinical psychologist, and he developed the Sternberg's Triangle of Love, which talks about you know different kinds of love and how relationships are maintained. But he's also a big a critic of IQ for that reason alone. Yeah. Because there's so many different facets of, of intelligence. You know, I might score high on the IQ. I don't know how to find my way out of a wet paper bag. <laughs> you really I, don't. <laughs> I'm really crappy with directions. I'm dumb when it comes to directions. Yeah. Or when it comes to anything anything mechanical. Like I came home one day and Dalton had the entire washer and dryer taken apart in front in our living room, was putting it back together. I wouldn't be able to do that. There's no way. And so I say that to be like, if you do have a high IQ, great. That's awesome. You know, maybe it does mean that you can process things better or easier or faster. You know, maybe it does mean that you're competent to stay in trial. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but it shouldn't be used as this badge of honor because it's just one one I, one component of intelligence. When they're, Even though it tests for you know, six to eight different components of intelligence, it's just mm-hmm. one component. Right. And I think that's the big problem with it is, you know, it's it's just one of those things, like you said, people people can tend to wear those types of achievements as a badge of honor. It's the same thing with uh, ACT scores and SAT scores, and people can flaunt it. And, like, sure, those help you get into college and whatnot, but, like, if you're walking around with an IQ sticker on your car or a Mensa, I'm part of Mensa t-shirt, or, you know, you're flaunting your, I don't know, 34 on the ACT I'm not going to want to hang out with you. <laughs> like the the smart literally the smartest people I know do not do that shit. It's always the people who are between average and smart that then think all of a sudden I've got this high IQ. Look how good I am and you're like, "Listen, I've got friends who make me feel extremely stupid on a daily basis when I talk to them." You're no different than the rest. like stop. This is just stupid. You're making yourself look dumb. And it's like it's just one of those things where it's really annoying to to take something that supposedly places you above others and then yeah, you're like, look at me. I'm so smart. Hader. And I, I hate that. It's really frustratingly annoying to me all the time. But I just think because, like you said, it's a gatekeeping thing. It's the same people who, oh, I don't play any board games that aren't at least this complexity on Board Game Geek, which has no standard rating system. It's just annoying. Like, why, why do you want to be this way? You could just stop doing that, which would be more intelligent because you could have more friends. So, <laughs> well, and to your point, so to kind of tie all of this back to board games, I feel like, like Ooh. most of this topic has been me uh, just shitting on IQ and Mensa. <laughs> Interestingly, though, <laughs> tying, tying it back to board games, like you said, it's, it's another gatekeeping tool. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's, a, if it's a Mensa select, okay, it is selected by a group of people who you know, scored well on an inventory that was already uh, skewed towards white, wealthy people. Yep. So you have an element of gatekeeping there. You know, if somebody hasn't performed well on standardized tests, maybe they feel, because that's the thing, if you have ADHD, again, that might skew you being able to perform well on the standardized test. If you have anxiety, if you have a trauma, you might be you might not be able to perform as well mm-hmm. on IQ because your thoughts are thinking about you know, your trauma or anxiety or racing thoughts, so on and so forth. And so you, it's, it's, it's already gatekeeping enough because, again, it's selected by people who scored well on these tests. And also it can be gatekeeping too because you see that Mensa Select sticker and maybe you don't want to try it or maybe you don't feel like you're smart enough. It could, in my opinion, deter people from the hobby. Mm-hmm. If they already are, if they're trying to get into, the board game hobby is already or- overwhelming. Yeah. You know, it already has a barrier to entry because you have to, you know, learn the games or maybe it's it's games that was even for me like I'm not very good at learning games Delton's really good at learning games and so without Delton it'd be really hard for me to try new games because I'm, I'm not as good at learning new games as he is and so it's already a barrier to entry if you're trying to get into games but then you put the Mensa Select sticker on it and I feel like that's going to deter more people or make it make board gaming seem even more elitist yep. or inadvertently even more white and wealthy than it already is or can't be perceived to be I mean I think that's all accurate I'll step down off my soapbox now. You're fine. Uh, no, I'm I mean, shorter now. that's what we want to talk about, though, is because these Mensa stickers, you know, they're worn like a badge of honor on the board games. And so I think it's necessary to talk about. I mean, you see a you see a um, oh, what's it called? Like a uh, shut up and sit down recommendation pair. You just know that they liked the game and they recommend it. Cool. Well, they liked it. Well, I might not like all the games they like, but I know that they liked it and they're popular or whatever. I enjoyed these other games they liked. Or you see the Dice Tower seal of approval. 
and you're like, oh, cool. So the dice, you know, I generally enjoy those games. I can play this. You're like, cool. It's it, that's all just about what someone's perception of that game, if it's fun or not, if they enjoyed it or not. But Mensa has a different thing tied to it, where it's oh, that smart people liked this game, therefore I'm a smart person. I'll like it, or I don't think I'm smart enough. I won't like it. Or you know? I lost this game. I might not be smart. Yeah, exactly. So there's all there's all kinds of other elements that come into it, but in the end. Don't shy away from the Mensa sticker. It really means kind of nothing. It means kind of nothing. It means a bunch of people <laughs> got together in a weekend yeah. who could afford the... Also, Mensa, you have to pay to be a part of it, too. So once you reach the IQ level, then you have to pay to be a part of it. And so that's a whole other barrier to entry. So you have people who can not only score well on these tests, but afford the yearly dues and afford to take part in this little weekend getaway to play these board games, dang it. You would think if they were that smart, they would understand that paying for something like that's shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> da -da -da. No offense to those who are smart enough to get into Mensa. I'm I'm very happy for you if you take part in the, you know, educational seminars, if you take part in the you no know, Mensa magazine subscription and whatnot, and you get something out of it, that's awesome. I just think that we have to realize how this can be used for evil. For sure. I think that's a good wrap up there. Let's move to the question to get this episode done because I have to edit. And now, join us for a Malt House Games podcast special by Size Question. So the question for today, based off of trekking the national parks, is going to be if finances and time off and everything, if there was no consideration, which national park would you go to right now? Well, according to the little factoids on the cars and trekking in the national parks, Glacier National Park is going to be out of glaciers by 2030. I feel like we need to go today to go see the glaciers. I do really want to go to Glacier sometime. It looks beautiful. I know that it's not the most extravagant or beautiful one. Well, I'm sure they're all beautiful in their own way, but I want to go see the glaciers. And I feel I felt a, a real authentic sense of anxiety when I read that last night. And I was like, okay, I need to book a trip right now. Right. To go see the glaciers before they're gone in seven years. Well, the good news is it's not too expensive to fly up that way. Like, we, we can plan that sometime. Uh, for me, I think mine is going to be Gateway to the Arctic uh, up in northern Alaska. It's the only park completely within the Arctic Circle. There are no roads, no maintained trails, no facilities. No service up no there. No service, no anything. You literally just have to take, like, an air taxi in, and then you're just in nature, and you have to hike and camp with no campgrounds like you it's it's rough in it and then it's how how many million acres like 90 some million acres it's ridiculous number of acres i want to go that's probably my number one because it's so inaccessible and it's the one that would be the hardest and most time consuming and most expensive to get to so if i didn't have to consider anything else it'd be gateway yep that's where i'd go there well I think that that's everything for the episode. I want to give a shout out to our amazing Patreon patrons. Thank you so much to Alan, Jennifer, and Cliff for backing at a level in which you get shouted out on the podcast. Thank you to all of our other patrons that support us at patreon.com slash malthouse games. Uh, you can head on over there and check out our different tier levels and things like that if you just want to throw us a buck or just take a look for fun and just say hi. That's fine as well. You can also say hi at all social media at Malthouse Games, M-A-L-T-H-A-U-S Games. You can find Haley at S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-O-Y-G-E-E-K. -E -E that is at Squirrely Geek. You can also send us an email if you want, if you think there's a game we need to find to look at, a beer we need to try, a question you want us to answer, or a topic you think we should cover. Uh, send that email to contact at malthousegames.com. And I check that email probably once a week or so, and I'm generally pretty bad at replying to that email, so keep that in mind. He's checking it right now to make sure he has I nothing I literally standing. am pulling it up to checking it right now. Right now I have an email from someone saying, fix your Instagram. My colleague Stephanie just found you on Instagram, loved your content. I get these crap all the time, and I hate it. Uh, yes, Don't I... Don't be like Stephanie. Give us game reviews. Give us game reviews? Or games to review. G <laughs> tell us a about games to review, and tell us topics and questions and all that fun stuff, but I think that's going to wrap this episode up. I need to edit and get this out in about an hour 45. So I should be able to just wrap it up by that time. Oh, so I guess that's everything. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to Malt House Games episode number 143. Yeah, I think that's all. Uh, <laughs> my brain's bouncing around trying to figure out if I missed something. Until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. We'll see you folks later. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.